Welcome back, friends. Welcome back to Solutions Watch. I am James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. It is July of 2024, and today we're going to be talking about solutions around a problem that I know many people in the Corporate Report audience are familiar with, and that seems like one of those intractable problems. What can we possibly do about it? Well, let's let's find out. And today we're going to talk to somebody who is quite knowledgeable about this subject, both the problem and potential solutions, and someone that should be familiar to corporate reporters out there who have paid attention to the archives. Specifically, I'm talking about Peter Kirby, who you might remember from interview 1013 on the history of chemtrails back in 2015. And also, uh, we recorded a conversation in July of 2016 about his book, The New Manhattan Project, or Chemtrails Exposed, A New Manhattan Project. But let's bring him back on the program uh, today to talk about what he has learned in the intervening years. Peter Kirby, good to talk to you again. James, it's a great honor. All right. As I say, it has been, what, eight years since we've talked? And obviously a lot of information has come out in the intervening years, CIA admissions and and open admissions of various tests of various geoengineering projects, etc. Uh, again, you could fill an entire book with what has happened in just in the past several years and so let's start by introducing yourself, your work, for people who don't know or didn't catch our previous conversations. Who are you? How and where and why did you get into this subject? And what, what did you write about in your book? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I first got into chemtrails uh, over a decade ago. And uh, to make a long story short, I became, of the, I be, I became aware of the fraud that is 9-11. And I asked myself, okay, what else have they been up to? You know, what else has the, has the old dinosaur media been lying to us about? And so I turned to the new media and I saw all these amazing stories. And uh, Chemtrails was just one of them. And I kind of glossed over it at first because I thought, you know, that's crazy. Why would they be spraying things out of planes that just wrecks everything? They're going to spend all this money to spray things out of planes so that they can destroy all their own stuff. You know, but uh, as time went on, I started seeing more evidence, specifically the 2010 documentary, What in the World Are They Spraying? When I saw the scientific evidence for this, that was what convinced me. And I, and I said to myself, you know, uh oh, th this is real and, and this is absolutely horrible and absolutely unacceptable. And uh, ever since then, it, it's been a passion of mine, and it really started out as just solely as as a passion, as a, as something like you know, okay, I'm going to expose this. I'm going to do my best to to bring the the proper information to the public so that they understand that this is going on. Because I figured, well, as soon as anybody knows that this is going on, they're going to find it totally unacceptable, and there'll be a groundswell against it and all this. But as you know, to this day, there's still maybe only. 10 to 15 percent of the population that's even aware that this is going on so you know but in the meantime i did have early successes one of the things that made my name was i found the california air resources board data on their website showing the elevated levels of aluminum and barium in the ambient atmosphere charts that were showing elevated levels from the mid 90s where I, the mid nineties is uh, where I later learned that the domestic large scale spraying operations started and the, and the levels of aluminum and barium were going up and up and up until 2002 when they stopped sampling for it for some reason. And I never really got a straight answer out of them as to why they did that. They said, oh, we switched over to another system and all this, you know, that's all BS. When they saw those, those rate raising levels of aluminum and barium in the ambient atmosphere, they should have been ringing every alarm that they had because in their own literature, they say none of this should be in the atmosphere at all. They classify aluminum and barium as toxins. And I took screenshots of these charts and I, I posted it online. I think this was what got me noticed with activist post. I was just posting in, in like form, form websites and uh, in comment sections and things wherever I could post. And uh, I think it was probably the post on the what I guess is still today, I haven't been there in a long time, but there's a forum website called Godlike Productions. And I think it was that posting that somehow Michael, an activist post, he's the editor at Activist Post, got a hold of that and saw that and just published it. 
and and he didn't even like you know notify me of it. I just found it posted on on, a, on this neat website that I thought was really cool. They had a lot of great stories on there. So then I contacted him, and then that's where that that ball started getting rolling because you know he he wanted more stories on the chemtrail thing. So I kept on digging deeper and deeper, and then I did a big like multi-year investigation into just the history of weather modification. And I came out with a paper called, uh, who was it? A history of the new Manhattan project. That was during that investigation. I, I started seeing that this was an evolution or an outgrowth of the original Manhattan project that produced the world's first atomic bombs. And so I felt like I was going out on a limb a little bit when I started calling it the new Manhattan project, but since then, I've found nothing but evidence to corroborate this. And uh, yeah, so uh, it's, it's been a long road. Uh, I've been doing this for over a decade. I started researching in about 2010. That was when the documentary came out that changed my mind. So it's been 14 years since then. And, uh, you know, I, I feel really good. This is the what, I, what, we're, what you're looking at here is the cover of the second edition of the book. There was a first edition in 2016 of the same title. Uh, chemtrails exposed the new manhattan project available exclusively exclusively on amazon and then in 2020 yeah 2020 came the the second edition i think the second edition is much better than the first one if you bought the first one go ahead and buy the second one because you'll you'll be completely satisfied because it's a complete revi revision and update of everything and uh I, I don't i still to this day i don't have a, a whole lot of desire to change anything in the book that this book that I released four years ago, because it's, it's extremely solid. And, and I think it'll, it'll show people, you know, the, the whole story, uh, the who, what, when, where, why, and how of all this after reading this book. I mean, I, I know for myself after doing the research and writing it, I, I feel like I have a very thorough understanding of what exactly is going on here. You know, something that we didn't have, in 2010, we were just barely cracking the surface in 2010, you know, guys like Dane and uh, Michael Murphy, uh, rest in peace, and uh, Francis Mangels and Mauro Oliveria, you know, um, we didn't know that we're just, there were planes spraying stuff, but, and that's about all we knew. But, you know, when you start digging into the history of weather modification, and, and you realize that the only reason that planes have ever dispersed materials at, at altitude is for weather modification. Then you start, you know, connecting all the dots and you start seeing how all the motives for it, all, all the, uh, the history of it, how it came out of the, the original Manhattan project. And, you know, what they're doing is they're using a lot of the time when they talk about nuclear, this and that, they're actually talking about weather modification. It's, it's, it's actually a euphemism, often a euphemism, the, the word nuclear, these, uh, you know, in government speak is often a euphemism for weather modification. I heard Trump talking the other day and he's in, you know, uh, John Trump is uh, Donald's, the Donald's uncle uh, was, is in my book because he was the guy who looked over Nikola Tesla's posthumously recovered documents along with uh, some other guys that are mentioned in the book. But, uh, but uh, Trump, you know, the guy who's running for president, uh, was uh, was talking about how his uh, his uncle was the longest serving professor at MIT, and he was into nuclear, nuclear, nuclear. I didn't know that he was into nuclear. I knew that he that he had something to do with weather modification, but I didn't know that he had anything to do with nuclear. You know, so I mean, like when he was saying that on the speech the other day, I'm saying to myself, he's using he's using the word nuclear as a euphemism for weather control. And so that got me thinking that, okay, his uncle was, was involved in this pretty deeply as well. But yeah, there's, there's a lot of information in, in the book and um, I'm, I'm flogging it again. You know, I flogged it when it first came out, promoted it as best as, as I could. But then this brings us to why I'm here today is because there's a new movement afoot. And this is why I'm on Solutions Watch with James Corbett, because there are now all these bills moving through uh, state legislatures, particularly in the East. And this has spurred the mainstream media into life. And I've seen a little uptick in book sales and, and there's more interest. I look at the comment sections on these articles about these, these new bills that we're about to talk about moving through legislatures in, in the East. And one of them's already been signed into law in Tennessee. And uh, I see the comment section and man, it's just like an avalanche of uh, awareness 
that, that's coming up. And, uh, you know, I see this as a great opportunity for us to, to come forward. Uh, you know, us, I mean, like me, Dang, Dang Wigington, Jim Lee, you, anybody, you know, my editor at Activist Post, uh, anybody who's been into this issue all this time, this is an opportunity for us to say, hey, look, you know, we have everything here. Look, here, here's the evidence. You guys are into this now. Maybe you're not aware of, of all this stuff that we've been working on for all this time. So, you know, I'm eager to, to get this information out to the people and I'm eager to talk about the, the solutions that are, that are now coming forward. As you say, this is a wonderful opportunity, if for no other reason than, hey, it's difficult to dismiss and poo-poo all those crazy tinfoil hatware and nutters when you have all of these states literally with this legislation banning chemtrails. Wait, I thought they didn't exist. I thought Biden was a totally sane person. <laughs> you know, it's the same liars who lie about everything. Well, people are starting to recognize that. So, okay. I don't want to do a disservice to the years and years and years of research that you've done on this and all of the information. And I remember, for example, reading about John Trump and his connection to this and just other mind-blowing facts that you've accrued over the years. So I will direct people not only to your book, but also to activistpost.com, where you are now a staff writer. And I know they often, uh, they always post your, uh, the abstract podcast that you do, um, talking about all the new developments that are coming out because there's so much information coming out in this space. But you raised the specter of a recent, what caught my attention in my eye for a potential solutions watch was your abstract episode 29, eight states banning chemtrails? What? What on earth is going on? And I will link up the post where not only do you have the actual uh, podcast itself, but you have the breakdown of all of the states and the legislation involved. Tennessee, Illinois, New Hampshire, South Dakota, uh, Kentucky, Rhode Island, Minnesota, and Pennsylvania, which is interesting and amazing. Tell us about this development. Yeah. Yeah. I, I forget exactly where I heard about Oh, you know, I just kind of monitor stories on, on chemtrails. I think every once in a while I go to news at Google, news.yahoo, and I, I just search the term chemtrails. And maybe that's how I came across the story or it was posted maybe on, you know, SGT report or, or something like that, or maybe even activist post. Someone had written a story about it. And for some reason, at first, when I saw that story about Tennessee banning chemtrails, it kind of just like went over my head <laughs> and I thought, Oh, well, no, actually I, I did think, you know, Oh, that's kind of interesting, whatever. And then like, you know, a day or two later, I'm like, hold on a second, Tennessee just banned chemtrails. <laughs> What's going on here? You know? And, uh, so, uh, yeah, let, let's, let's get into that. There is a movement in the, in the, in California that's going on as well involving Renette Senum. So we, we can get into that too. I have some notes for that one. You, you wanted to talk about that one as well, but let's, let's get into these, these bills mainly in the East. The Tennessee bill is a done deal as of April 11th. They, the governor, I think his name was Bill Lee, signed into law a bill that bans the dispersion of weather-modifying substances. It makes a violation of this, of this law uh, a misdemeanor with a $10,000 per day per violation fine. And uh, it went into effect on July 1st. So it is now in effect. I, I contacted uh, the, uh, there was a certain a guy who was uh, behind the sponsor of the bill, a Tennessee lawmaker, I forget his name, but um, I contacted his office and they said, yeah, we've had a lot of interview requests, you know, we'll put your name on the list, but uh, don't expect anything because the legislature has, has gone uh, home for the, for, for the summer recess. And this is what's going on in all of these legislatures, as far as I can tell. They go home for a, a summer recess, and I don't think they're actually going to convene until next year, any of these legislatures in the East. California is one of the few states, I think, with a full-time legislature. But anyway, um, yeah, so, so there was Tennessee. And that was it was kind of um, mild in its language, um, pretty straightforward. Um, it might the way the Tennessee bill is written, you might think that uh, there's really not going to be anything to come of it. But you start looking at these other bills that are in the pipeline, such as uh, New Hampshire. There, there was actually one before. I, and we're going to do this in chronological order of, of when, when the bills first came out. And, and the first one actually to come out was something in Illinois that came out 
in uh, January of last year. And, and that one was an unsuccessful trial run. It uh, really didn't go anywhere. Um, but, and um, I think it was kind of a poorly written, but it, I think they were, you know, just, just trying to see what they could get away with. And that was just kind of a, a dry run kind of a thing. But there was a, a bill in Illinois, it, it was unsuccessful. But then New Hampshire came out with something, uh, a bill, and um, they, that was the, New Hampshire was the one that came out with this first kind of template for a bill that other states have, have since followed. Other states such as South Dakota, Kentucky, Rhode Island, and Minnesota, we're gonna talk about those as well. But let's talk about this New Hampshire bill. It, uh, it, it's that, the New Hampshire bill was also an, kind of another experiment because I've, I've heard that they, they've uh, actually gone back to the drawing board and uh, are doing some, some significant reworking of the bill. This is one of the latest videos that, that I watched uh, with the people who are responsible for the bill talking about it in front of some, some committee there in New Hampshire. But what's really interesting uh, is that this bill is a template for, for other bills that have since arisen. And, and this one uh, has, has significant teeth. Uh, we're talking about felony penalties of $500,000 and two years in prison per violation, if you're caught spraying uh, any substance that is uh, spraying substances that are designed to uh, modify the weather. And uh, also there's some other aspects of this bill I would like to talk about. They also say that, uh, they, that this, uh, this bill in New Hampshire is also seeking to ban excessive electromagnetic energy, which is the second component of what I call the new Manhattan Project. They spray the stuff out of planes, and then they hit it with electromagnetic energy. So you have a binary weapon system that opens the doors to all kinds of different ways of modifying weather, all kinds of different things you can do. You can create any type. I, I believe you can create any type of weather that you want when, when you employ those two things. You know, the conventional cloud seeding industry just sprays silver iodide out of a, a plane and that, that, you know, has an effect upon the cloud, makes it rain or it suppresses hail and this and that. But, you know, what I call the new Manhattan project is this second generation of weather modification, whereby you're spraying something out of a plane and then hitting it with electromagnetic energy. So they're addressing the electromagnetic energy in New Hampshire, which is promising. And in this bill, they, they talk about states' rights. They say, you know, it doesn't matter if the federal government is approving this. They they have they say themselves a lot of these people behind these bills and in these bills themselves they they cite this report that's come out of the Biden White House, talking about how you know it's it's basically the same old bull that they've been pushing for decades about how you know solar radiation management management geoengineering oh there's global warming we're gonna have to spray you. And all this, you know, so but there's they're saying in New Hampshire, they're saying, OK, well, you can you can say that at, at the federal level, but we have states rights and they go even further. They say even if this is some kind of international thing, like let's say they don't mention the U.N., but I think it's implied, you know, if it's some international group that's giving uh, some some kind of OK to, to spraying stuff over their state, they say, no, we have states rights. We're asserting our rights as, as a state and you can't do this here. And uh, they also start talking about uh, a framework for in investigating violations of the bill, uh, where, whereby uh, you know, you're supposed to contact a certain government group in different states. You're either contacting like county sheriffs with information regarding you know, evidence uh, of planes spraying things or, or excessive EM, or, or in different states uh, that, that we're gonna talk about, you're, you're contacting uh, like environmental uh, offices uh, of the state and going to them with uh, photographs, rainwater samples, these type of things. And, and not only that, the, the bill talks about how the, the state is supposed to be actively seeking this type of evidence. They're supposed to be posting things on their website and, uh, you know, other in other ways, I guess they, they talk about radio ads and things, I think, where they, they, they say like, you know, you're required, the bill says the state is required to actively seek information about excessive EM and planes spraying things. And, and so, you know, th this is really promising because, you know, these are the, the, the rainwater samples and the photographs and uh, other types of this kind of evidence. We've been collecting these kind of things for years. 
many years. I mean, there's people that have just mountains and mountains of this stuff. So that, you know, so that was the first big breakthrough, this uh, New Hampshire bill. And, and then other states have gone on to uh, produce similar bills, such as the next one was uh, South Dakota. And uh, it's it's very similar to the, the New Hampshire bill, uh, except uh, in South Dakota, there, there are a little different things. The, the one in South Dakota has already passed committee. This is the only one out of uh, these other bills outside of the Tennessee bill that has passed committee. It passed committee 7-0. And it's the South Dakota bill is is similar to the New Hampshire bill, and but they they do a little few few little different things where they talk about how local colleges and universities are to assist the county sheriffs or the the um, environmental offices in the investigation, you know, especially in in the in the way of uh, excessive EM, it's, it might be a little difficult to prove that you're being hit with excessive EM, but there are experts, especially in colleges. Who, who understand how to discern these things. And then uh, also it differs in that uh, it says the South Dakota bill says that the governor can ground planes with the state national guard. If necessary, the governor can, or if they, they see a plane in the sky spraying things over South Dakota, the governor can call on the national guard to ground the planes. This is in the bill. But and then this bill, the, actually, the South Dakota bill hasn't established any penalties yet. See, this is all an evolution. This is all in the works. This is all in the pipeline. This is all, uh, you know, being created as we speak. And then so in Kentucky, this is another one that's following the template of the New Hampshire bill. Uh, but the, the, the differences in the Kentucky bill are that uh, they get a little esoteric in the Kentucky bill. They, they start talking about masers which is uh, some type of laser. I'd have to ask Jenny, you know, I'm not a science guy. Jenny is my science advisor who had a Q clearance with the Department of Energy. She, she's really great. And she's been on the different shows. Uh, most most uh, usually she's on the the dark or the uh, Dave Zublick show. It's called the Wake Up Show now, something like that. She's been a regular on that show. And, and she was my science editor for my book. And uh, But then they, they mentioned Mazers and they mentioned artificial intelligence in the Kentucky bill. And this is like completely esoteric because, I mean, these are the type of things that like my mind is just starting to wrap around these type of things, such as artificial intelligence and how that plays into all this. Because this project is so huge, I don't think I think it's beyond the capacity of, of humans to manage it. You're going to need some kind of supercomputers with artificial intelligence to be able to like manage all, all these different things that are constantly going on. I mean, you know, weather is is a. Uh, something that's often described as, as chaos, as a definition of chaos. And, uh, you know, how, how is any one human or group of humans supposed to stay on top of all that 24-7, 365? But, yeah, they start in the uh, Kentucky bill. They're talking about uh, artificial and that how, you know, artificial intelligence is uh, probably playing into these, these types of uh, weather modification operations. And this one has teeth as well. The Kentucky bill ha has a $500,000 penalty per violation and and it's a felony as well at per violation you're paying five half a million dollars and uh, every every time you violate uh, every time you get a violation that's another felony uh, they don't st i don't think they stipulate the um felony penalties like prison and stuff yet but they are calling it a felony and then rhode island is another one following the new hampshire template and uh, this one has also had no committee vote yet, just like the Kentucky bill, the one we were just talking about. But um, the Rhode Island bill, how it differs from, from the other ones, it's largely the same as the Kentucky, South Dakota, New Hampshire. But it, it differs in, in that they note that the, the things that are sprayed out of the planes may be combustible agents. Now, this is another thing that, that's on, on the cutting edge uh, of chemtrail research. I mean, this was something that I was really uh, intrigued and amazed to, to, to find that, uh, that I found a fire captain here in Northern California who says, yeah, absolutely. This stuff, he's on record on the, in the new media. I forgot his name, uh, but I, he's in my, I think he's in my paper, uh, chemtrails, the root cause of the California wildfires or something like that. I wrote an article about that uh, some time ago, but uh, he says, yeah, absolutely. The, the stuff that's sprayed out of the planes 
that settles all over all the, the plants and everything and is absolutely an accelerant. It's, to, it's combustible. Uh, Dr. J James Mar Marvin Herndon, uh, the world famous uh, PhD scientist who I've been working with and he has a, a, a great presence in my book, um, he was kind of speculating about that because, you know, James, if you, if you have something that's put into a powder, um, it becomes combustible. You might not think that it would be combustible, such as like corn or soybeans or something like that. But if it's in a fine powder and just kind of floating around, you like you you go inside of a. Um, I mean, I don't want you to do this. Don't do this. I'm just just kind of a hypothetical situation here. But if you go inside of like a grain silo. And there's like, you know, just kind of dust from the grain that was in that silo and you light a lighter, the whole thing's probably going to blow up because it just when stuff is, is in the air and it's in very fine particulate form, it tends to be combustible. And uh, the, 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 fi the fire captain, if I'm not mistaken, he, he likened the, the, the chemtrail spray that settles all over everything to thermite. So, he, I mean, we're talking like, you know, incredibly combustible. And uh, yeah, so in Rhode Island, they're, they're talking about the Rhode Island bill. They're talking about combustible agents. And they're saying that it contributes to forest fires. The, the stuff that's being sprayed out of the plains. This one, the Rhode Island bill has teeth. $500,000, half a million dollar fennel, felony penalties and or at least five years imprisonment per violation. Five years imprisonment and five hundred thousand dollars per violation in Rhode Island, and and then Minnesota has a basically one that's kind of the same template as the other ones, and that one has teeth as well. Half a million dollar fennel, fen, fennel Why do I want to say fennel Felony. Fine, <laughs> but uh, yeah, and uh, so most most of them have big, you know, gnarly teeth that you don't want to mess with. And then there's uh, in Pennsylvania has been recently introduced at the time that I came out with the article and video, article on activist post and video on my channel, The Abstract on Rumble. At the time that it came out, uh, that bill in Pennsylvania had not come out yet, but it had been promised by Doug Mastriano, who is a, a pretty famous politician who ran for governor uh, who was nominated for the, had got the GOP nomination for governor in 2022. He didn't win, but, um, you know, that, that Pritzker guy won, you know, the big job of the hut looking character, but um, Doug Mastriano is MAGA and, and, and he's, he's all about it. And at the time he, he had not released the bill. Uh, my article came out, but since then the bill has come out, it's posted on, on the website, Americans for a clean atmosphere.com. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. These are the people behind all of this. Okay. So, but we saw, so when I saw that there was basically a template for these bills and they were large, a lot of them were, were very similar. I said to myself, okay, there's, there's something behind this. There, there's some kind of force driving these bills through some kind of grassroots movement. And I'm not really sure how I found these people. Like I say, you know, I just kind of poke around and, and just find things. Uh, there were actually a few years where I wasn't even poking around, but lately I've been poking around quite a bit. And I found this group, their website is Americans, the number four, Americans for a clean atmosphere.com. And if you go to their website, it's a very simple website. And on the homepage, they list all of these bills. They say, here, look, here, here's the one in, uh, what did I say? Here's the one in Tennessee. Here's the one in Illinois. Here's the one in New Hampshire. They just go down the list. Here's the one in South Dakota. They give you the, the bill number. You know, it's like HB 764 or whatever. They, they give you the, the numbers of all the bills so you can look them up all your, yourself. And, and, and I said to myself, okay, these are pro this is probably the people who are behind all of this, right? And, um, and, and just before we get into all this, I'd like to say they have recently posted on their website three new ones since my article came out, <laughs> Ohio, Missouri, and South Carolina. I just saw these today. Hmm. You know, I, I didn't really have uh, time, all right. time to 
review all of this. Breaking but, news here. And yeah, I, I just want to interject to say that people who are interested in this and, and looking at these actual bills, they're all linked up in your article. So people can follow that link from the show notes if they want, and they can find all of that. But as you say, Americans for a Clean Atmosphere has this information, including the brand new stuff. I want to get into sort of what you think the bigger project here is and what's really going on. But you did raise... Uh, sort of parenthetically there, something that I also wanted to talk about, which was Renette Senum and the Save Our Skies organization. Can you tell us about that and who and what that is? Yes, yes. Um, right, but before we jump into that, I just want to finish up with AmericansForACleanAtmosphere.com. They have a sister website. I have notes, so it's no problem getting back into Renette Senum. They, they have, the Americans for a clean atmosphere.com has a sister website called zero geoengineering.com. And it is excellent. It is excellent. It's right up there with the top anti geo geoengineering websites, such as geoengineeringwatch.org and Jim Lee's website, climateviewer.com zero geoengineering.com. It's got tons and tons of it. Great information on there. Rock solid stuff, not speculation. We're talking government reports, patents, uh, just super credible everything, and I'm so impressed with what they're doing. And I'd like to I'd like to say one more thing. I contacted them. I wanted to interview somebody from their organization. They took a few days. They got back to me. They said that they don't do interviews, but I, I think the audience deserves to know. And th this name would probably be on the same email if they if an audience member emailed them themselves. There was a name that got back to me, Beverly Foster. Now that's a common name, so you can. I, I tried going online and finding this person. It was not readily obvious as to who this person was, but uh, par apparently there's a person named Beverly Foster who was intricately in intricately involved in all of this. And also another th another place you want to go if if you want to start start getting involved here is the Legal Action tab at geoengineeringwatch.org. Now, in the in the West. OK, all the if you'll notice, all those states that we are talking about, those are all in the east or the Midwest. And uh, but there's also a new movement in the West. There's also a new movement in California. I interviewed the, the woman who is at the focal point of this. Her name is Renette Senum. The, the interview is posted on, on my channel on Rumble, the abstract. And uh, it was, uh, I think, uh, right next to the, 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 the video. There was an, also an article on Activist Post. There's always an art, art, or almost always an article on Activist Post and the video on uh, the abstract on Rumble. And I think these the the one about the eight states banning chemtrails is right next to the Renette Senum interview. And uh, yeah, I, I, I interviewed Renette Senum. I'm a little hot here, but I think that's probably a good thing. Um, but I interviewed Renette Senum. And uh, yeah, she's the former mayor of, uh, she served two terms she was on the city council and then she served two terms as mayor of this city called Nevada city, which is up in what we call the gold country, like on the way to Tahoe from uh, the Bay area. And, and you say, okay, she was the mayor of a city. Yeah. Politicians suck, you know, <laughs> so what, but she, she resigned. She was about to serve a third term as mayor of Nevada city. And she talks about this in the interview, but, but right when she was about to, to um, take her oath of office was when COVID came down and she saw all the massive fraud happening and how the government was just completely abandoning best practices and, and, you know, the law and little things like that. And she said to herself, you know what, I'm not doing this. I resign. Can you imagine that? That's what she did. She's she's quite amazing, and um, I, I think that that she has a good shot at at really getting something done here. And you know, she had been aware. I'll kind of encapsulate what what the things that she talked about in the in their interview here. If you want the whole story, you can go look at the interview. But you know, she's she had been aware of chemtrails for for some time. She said uh, you know ten or fifteen years. But um, when, you know, she, she resigned her post and, and it was something, you know, high on her list of priorities that she wanted to get done. So when she had some time on her hands, then she started digging in. She started, you know, trying to figure out what we could actually do here to, to get these things stopped. And 
you know, if you're like me and everybody else out there, you say to yourself, yeah, we want the chemtrail stopped. You know, we want this, this project to end, but there is low hanging fruit here and her and the people she's working with, she and the people she's working with, they've developed a, a strategy here. They have been in the process of preparing a lawsuit, but there are other things that they can do. And they're not necessarily, in fact, they're not going after the, the New Manhattan Project or geoengineering straight off. What they're first going for is the conventional cloud seeding business, the conventional cloud seeding industry, which has been around since 1947. They spray us with a toxic substance, silver iodide, routinely. Not only from planes, but from ground generators. Uh, this is uh, a matter of uh, record. Uh, PG&E, the, all the power companies, uh, Southern California, Edison, Pacific Gas and Le Southern California is the one in the south, and then Pacific Gas and Electric is in Northern California. They just have these generators, uh, ground-based generators, that they just turn on, and they just start spewing silver iodide particles out of it. And they do it at times when there's a wind that'll take the particles up the, the face of the Sierra Nevadas, and, and then th these particles will help nucleate, will, will help uh, generate more, more snowpack up in the Sierras and up by, you know, behind the reservoirs uh, to uh, specifically uh, res reservoirs that are uh, held in by dams that have hydroelectric power generators in them. That's why the power companies are interested because you have more water in the dam and you, get, you generate more power. You see that they're doing it because it makes money a lot of money. And the, if you look at the motives chapter in my book, you'll see that, yeah, they're seeing returns of like, you know, 20 to one, like they spend $1 and get 20 back when they do this type of stuff. And so, um, yeah, this, this stuff has been going on, particularly in the West. They're, the, the conventional cloud seeding industry doesn't really exist in the East because th their problem in the East is actually too much water. But in the West, the problem has always been too little water. And so the, the the weather modifiers, the, the main thing that they do is, uh, you know, generate silver iodide particles to cause precipitation and, and cause more rainfall. And, and uh, I, you know, it was really hard to, to find the information about the toxicity of the substance that they're routinely using, silver iodide, in the weather modification literature, almost like 95, 98 percent of it. 98, 99% of it. They're just saying, well, you spray silver iodide and the biological impacts are, well, you get more rain here and then less rain over here. And, you know, maybe the deer will migrate to where there's more rain or less rain, depending on, you know, what they're feeling or whatever. That's not the question. That's not what we're asking. We're asking, what, what does this do to the ecology of an ecosystem? What does this do to the ecology of our environment? You're spraying a toxic substance. And, uh, you know, thank God, if you dig deep enough, like I did, you can you can pull out some reputable information on these things. And of course, it's not good. Of course, you know, it, it kills like uh, things lower down the food chain. And, you know, it, you can't really do that because it destroys the environment. And it's uh, I, I think it's killing a lot of the trees as well, uh, you know, along with the with the uh, geoengineering programs, but um, th it's bad news, man. They're, they're just spraying silver iodide, toxic substance, since 1947 into the, into the environment routinely like it's nothing. And they, they've been getting away with it because the, the GE scientists, General Electric scientists, Irving Langmuir and Vonnegut, when they first made the big press explosion about uh, weather modification, spraying things out of planes, they were using dry ice. They did that for the press. A month or two later, they're using silver iodide, lead iodide, whatever they want. And then by that time, of course, you know, that's that's yesterday's news. Nobody's paying attention. Right. See, see how they got away with it. And, uh, and so, so you know, yeah. that that yeah. speaks to the types of manipulations that go around in perception management around this topic. And uh, I mean, there's so many examples of that and the types of limited hangouts and other such things. So I guess that brings us down to the brass tacks of this issue that we're covering today. I want to get your take. I have my own thoughts about this, but I want your take on what you think, why there is this sort of renewed push and energy behind talking about geoengineering and spraying and chemtrails at this time, where this push is coming from. What what does this actually mean? What are, what are these states banning this or at least proposing legislation? What does it really mean for the anti-chemtrail movement? 
I, I think it's great. I think, I, uh, well, you know, I think it's uh, been a culmination. Like I said, when, when we first started seeing planes in the sky, spraying things, we had no idea what, what, what that was. Like, okay, there's a plane with a big long line behind it. I mean, it's obviously particulate matter. And, uh, but what does that mean? Like, you know, I, I you know, <laughs> it's like the riddle of the Sphinx or something, you know, but over time, you know, people such as you, such as me, such as Dane Wigington, such as Jim Lee, such as I could go on and on. We've been coming forward with the undeniable hardcore evidence. I mean, one of the episodes on, on my, my show on Rumble, the abstract is chemtrails are real, the hard evidence. And I show what one, two, three, four, five different ways that of uh, irrefutable scientific evidence that shows that we are being sprayed. And uh, I could go over that, but it's, you know you should go watch the. It's my it's my uh, most viewed video, so it, there's there's quite a bit of good information there. But you know we've we've been compiling this information over the years. It's we've been persevering, James. We, we, we've been we've been sticking to it and sticking at it and, and finding all their all their bodies. You know, we've been finding where they've been burying all these bodies and we've been putting the story together. And over time, this is what I always figured over time, more and more people become aware and then you reach a tipping point. And then somebody like Beverly Foster comes along and and, you know, knows how to organize and and, and get people into a movement that's actually bringing this into the Overton window, in, in Overton window, into conventional wisdom. Because when you—that's that, why the mainstream media just, you know, suddenly came into life for years. There, they were just completely ignoring the issue. I was watching for—it must have been about four years, where, where uh, they were just not covering it at all. I, you know, I because I periodically search for new articles on the subject, uh, you know, new hit pieces. It's always a hit piece, right? But, you know, at least it's, at least it's something. And, and when the yeah. Tennessee bill, not even not even before the governor, not even after the government governor signed it, after it passed uh, one of the houses, I think it maybe even had to pass another house after that. But there was a certain point where the, the mainstream media analysts, I guess, they figured, uh oh, this this thing is actually going to be signed into law. And, and then there's a, an explosion of articles, you know, all running defense, all, all running interference for, uh, you know, saying, oh, no, this is not going on. You know, oh, these crazy people, uh, it's the, the you know, Republicans, yeah. it's the Trump crazies, you know, and oh, what are they doing? They're talking about chemtrails. Oh, my gosh, these people are out of their mind. Right. You know, but at least but, they're saying something. But you see, this is this is where my mind goes. Maybe I'm overly cynical, but I think, but part of what is going on here is part of that limited hangout dialectic that is being used to steer the conversation in a way that will benefit the fact checkers because I have certainly noticed in the last few years, there's been a lot more attention towards the theoretical, we should start maybe thinking about experiments towards the idea of maybe blocking the sun and solar radiation, starting this type of dialectic essentially going in the mainstream narrative. And generally it'll be, oh, Bill Gates has a plan to block out the sun or something like that. And it'll lead back to Harvard and those types of, in educational institutions that are spearheading these above board out in the open programs that are again experimentally thinking about the possibility of engineering i've also noticed for example the um the brouhaha surrounding make sunsets that got a lot of publicity recently um doing its geoengineering essentially pr stunts of releasing balloons that will release particles into the stratosphere and it's just done a couple of balloon releases and that's it guys but that's why now it's okay to talk about geoengineering and that's see they're not talking about chemtrails and spraying from planes guys they're talking about these balloon experiments or harvard thinking about these types of things so where do, what do you think about that idea that maybe what we are being directed towards is the ultimate limited hangout that this is all some theoretical thing it's not about what's actually happening right now well they've been pushing the same bs for years and years you know i, I don't even really pay attention to what they're saying except you know i, I just look at the, the science history uh, of everything and, and and put put the pieces of the pieces of the puzzle together. I think what's been going on is that yeah, they're they're nibbling around the edges. They're they're trying to get some kind of 
public buy-in into this thing, you know, with just little things like, oh, it's just sea salt. Oh, we're just putting a balloon up. Oh, it's just this. Oh, it's such a tiny little amount of this. There's no no problem there. But every time that they they even do things like that, they get such huge pushback that um, they can't really go anywhere. They, they they're I think they're extremely they've been extremely frustrated in trying to get any type of public buy-in on these things because just the idea of it, I mean, people know how, how the government and corporations work. You know what I mean? You, you, you give them an inch, they take a mile and, and they know, I, you know, I think there's been so much, uh, such an explosion of, of awareness in recent years, especially as to how corrupt the government is and how corrupt, you know, how, how, how they're totally owned by the corporations and all this, that uh, people are just like, you know, no, we know where you're going with this. <laughs> no, that's no, I'm not I'm not I'm not giving you the OK on that one. So they just keep on running the same little thing. Just your foot, foot, no, your nose under the tent, nose under the tent, you know, like foot exactly in the, door, foot in the door and people are just like, no. Right. Like, no, you're right. right. There is a fundamental there is a PR battle of sorts that are t- that's taking place here. And yes, I think the public is swatting it down every time this idea is raised the first reaction is oh my god no we can never allow that to happen well unfortunately most people don't know it's already happening and has been for decades but i think you're right the for me the key takeaway of this hey i'm an anarchist i cannot get excited about states legislation that's supposedly a piece of paper that's going to protect us from stuff that's already happening which implies that if your state doesn't have that particular piece of paper then it's totally fine for the government to be doing it all of these types of issues that i have philosophical problems with but hey to the extent that it brings absolutely any actual anything to actual court and uh, hey if somebody gets actually convicted of this that would be a wonderful precedent to set i'm not holding my breath for that but it does at the very least as you say it is shifting that overton window that conversation is changing and this is i think a type of defensive move on the part of the deep state to try to deflect it towards oh don't no we're talking about those experiments and those things that people are thinking about we're not talking about this program that's already existed which is why this is our prime golden opportunity to be pushing this information even harder in front of people's faces. No, this is the documented history of what's already been going on that you haven't been told about. And here it is. So I think this is a a grand opportunity at the very least for information dissemination. And as you say, people are not buying the bull that is coming from the top layers of this pathocracy anymore. Uh, People are seeing through it in record numbers. So this is the prime opportunity. Which is why I think this is great that, hey, you have, you've got a ton of resources, not only your book, but also, as you say, the abstract videos of, like chemtrails are real, the hard evidence. There's a lot of stuff that people can be really sinking their teeth into. So let's wrap up on that positive note, talking about the way that we can direct people towards information that matters I want you to suggest and recommend for people who are maybe new to this subject, maybe people who haven't discovered about it yet. Where should they be going for more information about this? Well, you know, if I don't say so myself, I think the best thing to do is read my book, Chemtrails Exposed, a new Manhattan project available exclusively on Amazon, hardcover, paperback, ebook, or audiobook. But there are also, you know, lots of, of free resources available. I think the, the the two best ones, now there's two best ones out there. You know, geoengineeringwatch.org has always been there. And they, there's a really lot of great information on there. That's Dane Wigington's site. And now this zero geoengineering.com. Let me just make sure it's down here. Zero geoengineering.com. And then, you know, Jim Lee's website as well, Climate Viewer. And uh, I'm sure, you know, I have a whole bunch of websites actually listed at the end of every activist post article that I do on chemtrails. Sometimes I cover other subjects, but lately I've just been hitting the chemtrails again because of this recent movement, these recent movements for net sums and, and the, the bills in the East. And and yeah, James, you know, I don't have a whole lot of faith in, in government and these little papers that they shuffle around and whatnot either. But, you know, what I'm into is this awareness. I, I sense a different energy in the movement. And as soon as I saw that, I just started coming and putting out, uh, you know, new episodes every week. And, and you know, if, if people, if enough people buy my book, and I'm also asking for donate donations and 
that's all on my uh, website and on the articles and uh, all that. You know, if you look up my stuff, you'll find where where to donate. Um, you know, uh, if I can keep doing this, I'm going to keep on putting out a new episode of the abstract on Rumble every week about chemtrails. You know, that's what I started doing as pretty much as soon as I became aware of this this new movement. So, you know, I'd like to think that I'm somebody coming forward with a lot of good information as well. And there's, you know, cause you got to watch yourself and in, in this space, there, there's a lot of BS out there too, just tons and tons of disinformation agents. But at the end of every activist post article that I do on chemtrails, and there's been one a week recently, you go down to the bottom and I have about 10 different websites listed. And I think those are all the best those are the best chemtrail informational, geoengineering informational websites that I have found. So you can look over those and, and, you know, talk to those people if you want. But I think the big movement that's really going on right now is Americans, the number four, a clean atmosphere.com. And you, they, they apparently make it very easy to get involved. There's like a little button that just says, get involved. And you just click on that and they just, you know, start you on your way. You want to be a part of this movement. I think right now that's where you go. I think, especially if you're in the East and in any one of these States, Ohio, Missouri, South Carolina, Pennsylvania, Minnesota, Rhode Island, Kentucky, South Dakota, New Hampshire, and then even Illinois, which is the one that's actually not really going on right now. But yeah, anywhere in the East, I think, or even in the West. I mean, let's 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 do it everywhere. If you want to get involved with Renette Senum in the West, uh, her website is SaveOurSkies.org, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it's it's on the uh, her, if there's a link to it in the uh, the uh, abstract uh, episode where I interview her. And that was also an article on activistpost.com. So there's links to all her stuff there as well. And uh, so, yeah, th those are the best uh, sources that I know of. And I think we have a lot of really great information that we've been compiling over the course of more than a decade that uh, we can really use to just ram right down their throats. And, you know, I I'd like to think that my book is is the best one to uh, to really understand the whole picture here. I think a lot of people in these movements in the East have not read my book. I can kind of sense this from, you know, the videos I'm watching and the things that I'm reading and whatnot. And, uh, you know, I, I think that we'd be better off as a movement. I spent over 10 years, over $10,000, upwards of 100 uh, interlibrary loans, uh, made thousands of photocopies. I had, uh, you know, like my science advisor for, uh, who had a Q clearance with the Department of Energy. I would, had access to uh, the largest book depository in Northern California, as well as uh, UC Berkeley. And so uh, I, I just, I was fastidious putting this thing together. I was obsessed for years. Sometimes I would work like 16, 18, 20 hour days, just in a frenzy putting this thing together. And, but it's, it's not put together in a haphazard fashion. It's put together in a very logical fashion. It unfolds very well to the reader, uh, all the information. And uh, so, you know, it, I think we have everything that we need to to really bring this into the Overton window. And I thank you very much for having me on on your show today, James. All right, Peter Kirby. Well, thank you for the information. There's a lot of data here. So I will be linking up all of the various pieces that we've been talking about so that people can go and research this further for themselves. But as we've been saying, I think there is a change that's happening. There is an energy around this movement that hasn't been here for a long time. So let's make the most of it and spread good information about this subject. On that note, I'm sure we'll have cause to talk about this more in the future, but we'll leave it there for today. Peter Kirby, thanks for joining us today on Solutions Watch. James, it's a great honor.